Hi, folks. I'm Steve Arbato. I'm joined by my colleague, Mary Gamba. Mary, how are we doing today? It's a great day, Steve. How are you today? I'm doing terrific. And one of the things I love about what we do is we get to talk to interesting, compelling, very complex uh, folks. And today is no exception. We are honored to be joined by Dr. Henry Balzani, who is a retired physician, certified health and nutrition wellness coach, addiction specialist and lecturer, and co-author of the best-selling book, The Silver Lining Storybook. Doctor, great to have you with us. Thank you. Great to be here. Doctor, The Silver Lining Storybook, the premise is what? The premise is, there. Are, it, I'm one of the authors, there's 18 authors who uh, went through uh, difficult times in their life and overcame uh, the problems that occurred throughout their life. It's just supposed to be uplifting stories. So stay on this a little bit, on the addiction issue. You, you're an expert on it. You're a specialist. You lecture on it. You've said that our mental state, our attitude, the way we look at things has a great impact on our actions. Connect addiction to our attitude. Well, addiction... Uh... Addiction is not really not about the drugs. It's about what's going on in our brain and really what happens very early in life. Uh, most of the problems that cause addiction or the, that are the root causes are something called ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences. Right. And they occur in the family. So when I talk to lecture and lecture to people, lay people, they kind of get upset because they say, well, it's not my fault. But it affects the brains very early, and the brain focuses on this, and then it looks to feel better because it feels bad about something that happened. It couldn't recover from it. Uh, it, it just feels bad about it. And so it uses a substance, food, sex, drugs, to feel better or to try to resolve what's happening to them. And a lot of the problems that occur are from very good families, not bad physical sexual abuse, but just psychologically not being attuned to the child, you know, overlooking the child, not being emotionally available to the child. So as the child grows up, it doesn't understand what happened to him, him or herself to say, why am I doing this? If a child was physically abused or sexually ab abused, they may get to that through counseling. But when, you know, just avoiding a child or not paying attention to a child is not a thing happening to him. So he never realizes that. And a lot of kids grow up never understanding, well, why do I feel empty? Why do I feel not resolved? And, and that's the biggest problem. And trying to talk to parents is the hardest thing to do. Mary, jump in with Dr. Balzani. Yeah, well, Dr. Balzani, I actually have a degree in psychology, so you're speaking my language. It's funny, I, I obviously went to college, then met Steve, so I don't know uh, if it, well, I guess sometimes a degree oh, trust in psychology. Me, you use your psychology <laughs> background. <laughs> it definitely helps with working with Steve. No, I'm just kidding, Steve. Uh, but it is, it's always fascinated me, uh, been fascinating to me, how a childhood experience can really impact an adult life. What do you recommend, though, to adults who say, this is the best I am, this is because of my upbringing? What are some, like, one specific tool that you say to adults? Because there's so many people that say, woe is me, this happened. Instead of looking to the future and saying, you want to know what? I can make a choice. All right, my, my yesterday was pretty bad, but my tomorrows could be a lot better. What's one piece of advice that you give people that are watching right now to really make, you know, that conscious decision to change their mindset? Well, basically, you know, parents have to learn to be more emotionally available to their child. Someone comes to talk to them, they can't say, don't bother me, I'm, I'm finishing work, I'm on the computer. Uh, boys and girls, no matter what, if a boy is being bullied at school, the father can't say, hey, look, you're a man, just take it, don't worry about it. I'm really? That should work. have been said? <laughs> I should go back and talk to my father about that. <laughs> not, not in my family. My, my family says, hey, if somebody's bullying you, you, you know, you go take them out and do what yeah. you need to do, right? There wasn't a lot, the, doctor, there wasn't a lot of empathy in either one of our homes when it came to those kinds of things. But go ahead. No, not in those days. <laughs> exactly. But, 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 but there are consequences to that. Yes, 
you, you either grow up and be tough or you have problems the rest of your life. <laughs> or both. <laughs> or both. Right. Yes. But what's the advice to parents? Is it to, hey, listen, this is a moment. This is an opportunity. Be present and listen. Yes, that I mean, that's the basic thing to be present, to be be there for your child, to speak to them, ask them questions. You have to be relevant to your child to understand what their day is like, what they're doing. And I guess right now you're there all the time. But are you really emotionally present because the parents are working at home? They're busy. They're doing something else. So this might even be a worse time to be connecting to your child because everything else is going on. And that's why alcohol is increasing and a lot of problems are increasing. Let's clarify, we're taping this in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis in, in uh, mid-summer 2020 to be seen later. But I, I'm gonna follow up on this in the limited time we have. Our mutual friend, Walt Garino, who happens to be the chairman of the board of our nonprofit production company um, and a great friend with an extraordinary background. One of the things about Walt that's connected to this conversation is Walt's a very good listener. He's very present and he has high, what Dr. Daniel Goleman has called emotional intelligence. How important is having this thing called emotional intelligence and everything you're talking about? It's very important and it's, it's not something that you just kind of pick up. It's something maybe reading books, you know, Dr. Goleman's book or, or being understanding. And it's partly something that's emotionally in you that you're empathetic uh, you, you understand people, you feel for what they're doing. Uh, and if you're not really empathetic to people, you can't understand what they're trying to say or do. And you're just thinking in yourself. And that's a big problem nowadays. Final question. In the midst of the crisis we're in, the global pandemic, you sound like a hopeful, positive person. Yes. With all kinds of people struggling and worrying and so much uncertainty, give reason, give folks a reason to be optimistic moving forward. Well, uh, there was the Spanish pandemic in the, in the early years, and we overcame that. This is another pandemic which we can overcome. Uh, we have much better medicine. Uh, those days, there was really no medicine. Uh, and uh, We've become smarter and we're learning each time. This is difficult now, but each time something like this happens, we will come up with better ideas, better treatment, better vaccines, be better protection. And hopefully people will learn to maybe eat a little better and take care of themselves because the comorbidities are the biggest problem that are killing people with COVID-19. Dr. Henry Balzani, who is, has got so many aspects to his background, certified nutrition and wellness coach, addiction specialist and lecturer and co-author of the best-selling book, The Silver Lining Storybook. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for joining Mary and I, and, and we wish you and your family all the best. Thank you very much, and you too. Thanks, doctor. We'll be right back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Arbaugh with my colleague, Mary Gambit. By the way, Mary, Sunday mornings on News 12 Plus, between 10 and 11 a.m., how great is the programming? What can it is the see? best must-see hour of programming all weekend long. Let me What's tell you. What's on at 10? At 10 o'clock, you've got us, you and I together here, Lessons in Leadership with great guests, talking all about leadership and communication. What about 10.30? 10.30 Think Tank with you, Steve Adubato, and a variety of guests talking about an amazing range of topics. And also uh, on air with me is Nicole Swinerton, who is the senior producer of Think Tank. Um, and by, by the way, you can find us, Mary, all over the place, not only on News 12 Plus, but mm -hmm. on Spotify, yep. Best of NJ, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Business Industry Association, ROI, NJ.com, Meadowlands Media. Okay, you got it. All right. Go you to our hit website. it all. Hey, you forgot to add our website, stand-deliver.com. You can go there as well and check out past episodes. Let me tell you, that felt like we were plugging, which we were. Which we were. 
but this guy's learned more about branding um, than most. And some in this industry may not totally get it, but there's a reason why the step and repeat behind him says the International Union of Operating Years, Engineers Local 825, because that is Greg Lalavi, the business manager of the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 825. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you too, Steve. Good to see you, Mary. Good to see you. Hey, hey Greg. Um, Mary, how about we try this with Greg? We, oh, <laughs> we, <laughs> all right. Can, can we just say that out of all of Steve's ideas, many of which, most of which are very, very good. Steve's like, we can do this without Elvin and Frank. And this is even before we knew Elvin and Frank. He's like, let's use Zoom. We're just going to hit the record button. And guess what? We're going to do this interview and it's going to be great. And it, the, the content was great. It was the operation and the delivery and we couldn't manipulate where any of us were. So I'm glad we have the opportunity to do this for real this time. Yeah, by the way, Elvin and Greg, Elvin is our director and, and, and Frank handles all of audio issues. And, and I kept thinking, hey, it's early on. We can do it. No. It didn't look, Greg was great. <laughs> it just <Yeah. laughs> it wasn't right. Yeah, and by the way, better. so it takes a village, huh, Greg Lalavi? You can't Absolutely. do it on your own. No, you can't do it on your own. It's good. It's good to have help. And uh, one of the smart things to do is ask for help when you need it. I, hey, let me ask you. We're taping this at the end of June. It'll be seen uh, after that several times. You're, I've never thought you were great of all your leadership qualities of asking for help. Are you asking for help more? Uh, a lot more since this pandemic started. Sure. Uh, have, have to do it. For, for instance, we were doing webinars for our members and I couldn't run the board and, and deliver the content at the same time. So got one of the younger guys who knows a lot about technology to just be my producer engineer, uh, my director. I got to get him one of those t-shirts uh, that says director El on it. Elvin, just, <laughs> Elvin Badger has director. Your guy has to have a lot, bunch of different things. Yeah, but he, he kept everything straight for us and did a great job, uh, kept everything moving, turning different microphones on and off with different presenters. So in this atmosphere, uh, you can't be everywhere at once, despite Zoom technology and everything that might suggest you can. So, yeah, I've asked for a lot more help. But you and, know, one thing, oh, go ahead, Mary, jump in. I was just going to say one thing that I found, too, is that you need to have people on your team. You can't be an expert at everything, and especially in COVID. If you're going to try to figure out everything on your, you know, on your own and say, hey, yeah, I've got all the answers, it doesn't work. You need to have those experts on your team who are just as smart, if not smarter, than you are, right? Well, the way things are changing, the, the speed at which things are changing, we're all essentially building the plane as we fly it. So nobody's done this before. It's never happened before. Uh, so we don't even know what mistakes are. So we do the <laughs> best we can and we improve and refine as we go. You know, let's talk about innovation. In all seriousness, uh, I remember being in Greg's office. We do a leadership academy at uh, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. We actually have, our, I believe, our final seminar of this group coming up as we're taping this program. I believe it's next week. Yeah. But I remember being in Greg's office pre-COVID, <laughs> and we're brainstorming, as we often do, and we start talking about a podcast. And Greg's one of those people that just doesn't talk about it. He gets it done. But the whole idea, in all seriousness, of the logo behind you, you taping, recording with the logo, 825, the branding, that's pretty innovative and not the norm in the labor movement, fair to say? Uh, fair to say. And in the atmosphere we're in with everybody doing, call it Zoom, WebEx, go to meeting. there's so many of them now. Right. We've actually converted one of our offices into a recording type studio uh, with lighting, uh, with microphones. We're, we're purchasing other equipment so that we can do a podcast, but so that everybody on our team has a dedicated place to go uh, that, that has the equipment they need uh, to, to do Zoom meetings professionally and decently. And along those lines, Greg, um, we've actually talked about some of your presentations when you run these meetings. And one of the obsessions we've had in, in the Leadership Academy at uh, A25 is to push people to become better presenters and communicators, to be more engaging, and not just simply read the report for the meeting because it's not very interesting. Even if the information's interesting, they've got to look into the camera and practice it. These people weren't hired to do that, Greg. So is my, my question is, is what you expect from your business agents, right? Right. Um, and others, is it changing all the time in terms of what's expected for them to be 
the best leaders they can be? Absolutely. For, for instance, we did four separate webinars. And of course, these are all recorded. So we're going to take some time and go through the recordings. And I'm going to sit with each one of them and talk about what I think they need to do to improve. If we have to do more webinars going forward, we'll have until September uh, to work on it, to refine it. Uh, we're working on a webinar for our fund staff, which is about 50 employees. And group came up to me yesterday and I said, well, where are we at? How are things? And they said, they're okay. At which point I bounced off every wall in the office and said, oh, okay, isn't good enough. Um, you know, have we rehearsed it? Have we practiced it? Do we know what we're doing? Uh, because I don't want to come out of the box. We haven't seen those employees in a hundred days. They're working remotely. They're doing a fantastic job. Uh, but still the first time that we actually see them face to face, I think we, we have to do the best we can. Okay. Isn't good enough. And by the way, before Mary jumps back in, this is one of the ones that I'm never good with. It, it, I, I, I'm not going to, We've done things on the air and I've been concerned about how it looked or, I mean, even though I've been doing this for 30 years, I, I'm still obsessed and I'm, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm not, but I'm obsessed about the graphics. I'm obsessed about the look and the sound, and the feel of the show. That's why having, having uh, Elvin Badger and Frank Brown and the team we have has made such a difference. But when I'm nitpicking over these small things, I've had some people say to me, come on, it's not that bad. It, it, it's really, it's not that bad. That drives me crazy. You? You have to push yourself. Uh, so, you know, back in one, the once upon a time, I was a competitive swimmer. When you do that, it's you against the clock. I, I know whether how I do, and I have to hold myself to a standard. Uh, during the webinars that we did, the first one, I thought I was awful. And did you really? It, oh, terrible. <laughs> and I sat that evening watching the recording, and I was sitting next to my wife, and she pretty much had to get up and leave because I, I was muttering under my breath and saying a lot of bad words. And we had the first webinar on a Monday evening, the second one on a Wednesday evening. And I spent all day Tuesday in my office pushing myself to refine my presentation so that Monday was not a repeat of what I thought was horrible. Well, Greg, what were some of the, because uh, I know we've talked a lot about this and especially with the Leadership Academy with your team, what were some of the tips and tools? Because even if anyone's watching, even if they're not specifically working with a company or doing a webinar, they're probably talking to friends, family, or maybe even have a job interview using uh, Zoom or any of the other online um, programs. They're also running meetings, Mary. And running meetings, absolutely. So what were some of the uh, key tips and tools that you learned from that first meeting to now um, your later meetings where you feel like you're kind of getting into a groove? So with, with all of these on-camera meetings, I think it's fair to say that none of us were prepared or ever thought we'd be on camera. I mean, I never thought I'd be on Steve's TV show or, or any of those things as I grew up. So you, you have to stop, think, and go through it in your head, slow yourself down, know your material. You don't have to obsess and memorize because you're the only one who knows what you're going to That's say. Right. <laughs> True. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, you have to reach that comfort level where if you're at ease talking to somebody else in the room, if we were all three of us sitting around a desk having this chit chat, you just have to try to translate that into being on camera. Uh, some of the things like, I could be looking at the pictures of the two of you, uh, but I wouldn't be looking into the camera. This looks like I'm looking at you. That takes a little bit of practice, a little bit of refinement. Explain that to folks, Greg. We've done this on several shows. Greg is here on my screen, but if I wanna make eye contact with him, I have to look at my camera. He's doing the same thing. Right. Talk about the practice there. Well, it just takes some time to go through it and look at it. So I've practiced for Zoom meetings or webinars by actually turning my Zoom program on by myself and making sure that I see where the, I have a Mac, so I see the green light next to my camera and I just keep myself there uh, through the entire presentation. I'll have to look around every once in a while when some of the other people are presenting because I want to catch an eye on how they're doing sure. or what they're doing. Uh, to. You, you know, could do that, no big deal. But when, when I'm up at bat, I'd rather be present with the person and looking them in the eye as if they were in the same room. How much pressure has that put on others on the team? I mean, you're the leader of the team. They're all leaders, but you are the primary leader that they report to. How much pressure has it put on your colleagues to not 
go through the numbers and go through the report because I know that you're expecting more from them. So my, my question is, it is making them uncomfortable. One of the expressions that I've used in the academy with you and your colleagues that I use a lot is get comfortable being uncomfortable. I know it's uncomfortable. So what? That's the new reality. Go ahead. No, it's, it's all about getting out of your comfort zone and trying something new. And while I might not expect anybody to practice, rehearse, whatever, as much as I do, we're going to get to a point where I put the recording up and they can see it side by side. And there are some people on my team who did spend time and did work on it and really did a good job. How about the ones who didn't? Could you tell? It's, it's black and white. It's apples and oranges. It's very evident who spent a little time. And I believe when we're presenting uh, to our members who we work for, that that comes through. Who, who cared? Who really put some effort into it? Who wants to speak to the membership? Who wants to talk to them about what, you know, what their activities are and what their work is? And who is, as you said earlier, just reading the stats you know, off of a page? That's Checking off the that. box. Yeah. Um, you know, and doing it in a way like we wouldn't watch Sports Center with with a sportscaster who was just reading the stats off the page. They they more or less know what they are and, and what they want to say. Yeah, Mary, jump back in. Yeah, and and how have you found? I know most, if not all, of your team, Greg, right, work remotely. They're out in the field. They're on construction sites. Have you found a difference uh, post COVID nineteen in terms of just how they're leading themselves, how they're leading their teams, and most importantly, how you need to lead with them? Because I'm assuming, and I may be wrong, but is a lot of your communication with them now done remotely, or do you still have the advantage of being face to face with them? And what has changed in that regard? Well, the way they handle their job really hasn't changed at all because we were very used to working remotely. Uh, we invest in technology, so everybody has a laptop and an iPad and a phone, so they, they know how to go out there and use that technology. We've got so much information that they can access on the computer systems that we can tunnel into remotely, so they really never have to be in the office. Uh, two things that we've done is that we have reserved, or I've reserved time for each of them on different mornings, at least uh, groups, that I know that I'll be in the office, I'll be accessible. Uh, they, if they need to see me face to face, they can come in and they know they're gonna find me. Um, inside the COVID world, we're trying not to overload the office either. So when guidance said, don't have more than 10, we have seven people in the office generally anyway. So I have to account for those seven and then limit what else was coming in. Uh, as for me, you know, communicating to them, we've also done Zoom meetings in smaller groups uh, so people don't necessarily have to drive. We cover the entire state of New Jersey and New York all the way up to Delaware County. So I don't need people in a car for two hours if I can put three of them on a Zoom call and get the same thing accomplished. I'm sure they appreciate that too. <laughs> yeah, and, and Mary and I've had this conversation constantly and we've talked to you about it as well. Some of our clients and some of the people we work with push back. I'm an advocate, and I said this yesterday, Greg joined us for the Commerce and Industry Association. We partnered with them. I did a uh, seminar with Mary on leading during and communicating during the pandemic, and Greg made the mistake of joining the- um, <laughs> You were a victim, Greg. You had no uh, idea what you were getting hey, yourself How quickly into. did I call Greg Lalavie out? Uh, in the first 30 seconds, I believe. I was like, there's Greg. He won't, he won't be on your next one, so. <laughs> no, well, we'll keep coming back. Okay, yeah, good. But, but the beauty of that is, here's, here's the point I'm making, and I said this during the seminar. I actually, I don't understand people having scheduled meetings. You're supposed to have a meeting at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. This is a leadership issue, a management issue, communication issue. It's a respect issue. So you have a Tuesday 10 o'clock meeting. It's a Zoom meeting. And you tell your people, listen, um, it's going to be video or audio, either one, doesn't matter. And I, I've said, you're kidding me, right? How, how do you have someone just on audio? Like if we were doing this with Greg right now and he was just on audio, it'd be okay. But okay is not good enough. And so the pushback I've been getting, Greg, and the, there's a question here, I promise, is, Steve, you're unfair. Not everyone has the same technology. Not everyone has the same situation. Some people don't have the privacy. You shouldn't expect people to be in a Zoom meeting on video and audio. Audio is fine. I argue when they're only on audio, they're not that engaged. They're not that involved. They could take out their iPhone and start checking their, e their email or text messages. You, don't, you forget that they're there. 
The question is, how do you handle that? Well, for the webinar we're putting together for our fund employees, we mandated that everybody be visible on camera. Uh, there was no choice. We, we want to get a good look at what the reactions are because we're going to talk about how we might reopen our building, what we expect when people come back, uh, what we might be able to do remotely as we continue on. And we want to see what the reactions are. We wouldn't have those reactions on the telephone. Anyone push back? No, not at all. Uh, I, I think after, you know, after a hundred days of not being here, okay. uh, you know, we, you know, we, we need that, we need that kind of feedback, even if it's yeah. not overt and, and oral, we need the feedback of seeing the reaction. Real quick, before I let you go uh, and end the show, um, the training center, the training center is a big deal. Describe what the training center is. A lot of it, it's crane work. You got to be there. You got to be hands on, but some of it's remote. It's, it's been, it's a big deal. It's new, but it's evolving. Go ahead. Well, for classroom training, we've moved over to some remote training. Uh, we've had to, and we've tried to maintain numbers and whatnot at our training center. We closed down for a while to keep people out. We've reopened. Uh, operating a piece of heavy equipment is a, you know, a, a study in social distancing. Nobody gets near a spinning excavator or a bulldozer pushing dirt. So in that regard, we're fairly safe. We take the extra protocols of sanitizing machines and whatnot. Uh, but our students go down to the 61 acre training center and learn the craft of being a heavy equipment operator. Uh, and just this week, you want to talk about innovation or the way the world is changing. We had a piece of uh, fully robotic equipment there that we were teaching uh, students on. So, you know, as the world evolves, we evolve, but we will never stop training. Um, you know, that's, that is the lifeblood of what it is we do. Final question. Uh, Mary, go ahead, ask it. Oh, now you're putting me on the spot for the so, big final question. I know what you want me to ask. What is the biggest leadership lesson that you've taken away? Now, Greg, we've asked you this dozens of times, but we have not asked you it since COVID-19. Is there a unique leadership lesson that you've taken away post-COVID-19? You got uh, 30 post, seconds, go. Post-COVID, it's communication and staying, staying in touch with everybody. You know, again, as we had 50 employees go work remotely, I don't speak to every one of those, but I do speak to the management team regularly. Keeping people on the same page, keeping people focused uh, means that you have to stay present, whatever present might be. That's emails, that's Zoom type calls, that's phone calls. Uh, you know, it's using the entire toolbox, but you must remain present with everybody and bring your communication level up, not down, because you just can't have the chance meeting uh, you're somebody's not going to come to the union office just to grab some paperwork or whatnot, and then maybe just bop in to see me by occasion. Uh, you have to be a little more thoughtful about how you're going to run into people. And, and that means uh, being a little more overt in your communication. That's Greg Lalavi. I'm Steve Adubato. The really talented one other than Greg is Mary Gamba, who never expected to be on camera and now runs the show. Greg, can't thank you enough, buddy. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. I'm Steve, Mary, Greg. This has been Lessons in Leadership. Thanks to the team you can't see behind the scenes. They're real leaders. Uh, we'll see you next time on Lessons in Leadership. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen and I got my life back. The Sharing Network means to me hope, life, and everything. The Sharing Network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. A tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com.